Good evening. Buonasera. Everyone from the European Observatory of Memories and Remembrance and the Department of Democratic Memory of the City Council of Barcelona. Every year we organize a small, big event with respect to the historical processes and, uh, and remembrance and memorial processes about the common months of the Holocaust victims in this uh, year, it's uh, January 27th, approximately, different activities, Salvador Tinel, Plaza del Rey, well, and with the event of the City Council and the Observatory, the European Observatory of Memory, to turn uh, this commitment, political and professional commitment that we all have in this memory space and area, uh, which is very important and original, as the uh, prison where we are right now in the uh, heart of the Echample neighborhood in Barcelona. This year, we wanted to make uh, some considerations and some moral uh, event. Thank you for your presence. Difficult dates, uh, considering uh, the, the physical participation uh, and above all, to, I'd like to thank the speakers we have here, Sharon Rachel, who came from uh, Ferrara, Italy, and Dr. Giuseppe Calvet, a doctor and a friend and colleague, historian. Well, uh, we invited both of them because we wanted to connect this with uh, the history of Holoc the Holocaust, connected to, to the area of memory. Uh, and remembrance uh, for many years we have been uh, working on, on on trying to recuperate all these uh, areas uh, so that the transmission of history is not only done uh, through interesting uh, events but also in in places of, of of significance like this one here and since as you know that in our country in our cities in our states in our autonomous governments and some other countries, it's it's, it's hard to debate for the uh, memorial uh, uh, history. Uh, we wanted to to combine uh, a place which we we uh, found short ago with our colleagues from the foundation. That is the National Museum of Judaism and Shoah, that is located in Ferrara, and that. Uh, is also located in the old prison of the city of Ferrara. Common and uh, prisoners and, and, and uh, political prisoners like in Barcelona. We are very interested in this and we also invite, invite Josep Calvet so that uh, recently in his uh, uh, professional work we asked him to, to organize the uh, well, a part of, of history that was left aside and the, well, the, 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 the model uh, called model prison during World War II, many prisoners stayed here who came. Well, he'll tell us more about it, but they came. Uh, well, they arrived here escaping from Nazism during World War II, but not only Jewish uh, prisoners, but also people from other areas, from the allies group, from the resistance, from many different orders of life. Well, this combination of, of Holocaust uh, Remembers Day and the international perspective, I thought was good uh, and interesting uh, to, to set up this uh, conference and, and to coordinate this event uh, around these topics. With no further ado, let me now give uh, the floor to uh, Sharon, welcome. She is a curator in the National Museum of Judaism and Shoah in Ferrara, and also she coordinates the cultural uh, spaces. And in non COVID, uh, well, they had over 50,000 visitors, which is good for a city like Ferrara. So, uh, uh, there is a pedagogical and cultural interest and also an interesting uh, interest, which is very important for many. Uh, her main interest is the transmission, the, the museum transmission of history and museum and patrimony in these uh, spaces, in these areas, museology and the uh, s Jewish ceremonial art and uh, Hebrew Italian history since the 16th. Uh, century to the 18th century. I'd like to thank her for, for coming here in such complex days 
so her presence is very appreciated. This transnational vision is also enriching our project of mu future musicization of uh, La Model uh, uh, Prison. Well, Jose Calvet, very well known amongst us, the doctor from the, the University of Lleida, a big specialist uh, that we have in Catalonia and in Spain and Europe about the, 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 the fact that during uh, Franco's uh, repression and World War II, all these people that were refugees, prisoners, people that were escaping from Europe and, and wanted to cross the Pyrenees and, and, and to, you know, save their lives and, and, and leave a, 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 a Europe that was in the middle of a, a terrible war at all levels. And uh, his last book is, is being sold right now. It's a, a book that I would really like to recommend. It's second edition, and we'd like to congratulate you. And also this, this international uh, comparison of histories and of two twins that Nazism separated, and that, as he will tell you, are deeply rooted to the land of these, to these areas of, of uh, history. Uh, Sort was a small prison as compared to this one, from Sort to Tel Aviv. That's the name. Sort is the city. Uh, that was the first step of these arrests in the borders of this small, uh, you know, capture or these big captures in in, uh, in 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 World War II, and they went to sort, and then they were taken to Barcelona. Well, I thought that these uh, crossed histories were very interesting, and Sharon, obviously, uh, we are very interested in 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 uh, your project, your uh, museum uh, project, and how you turned the old prison in Ferrara uh, into a memorial a museum of Judaism. And uh, well, Shoah, you have the floor. And I will remove the mask. Uh, one of the things that we have to do in uh, today's uh, <laughs> reality. Um, First of all, thank you very much for having me, but also the museum here uh, to Eurom. It was really a pleasure for us. It's very interesting, actually, to see another case of a prison that, that has to be uh, transformed or uh, that, that has a new life. Uh, the case of Ferrara, you will see it's a, a, an, an interesting case, but also it's a little bit different from what uh, you were uh, working on here, because we have not only the part of the Shoah, or not only the part of a memo memorial memory, but also and mostly the reflection of the 2000 years of uh, history of the Italian Jews. So, of course, um, too much? Uh, you, do you want me to? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, the title is quite easy, From Prison to Museum. The name of the museum is very long. Uh, it is called MACE, Museo Nazionale dell'Ebraismo Italiano della Shoah, uh, or National Museum of Italian Judaism and the Shoah for Friends MACE. That's how we call him. And this is actually the museum. So if you will come today, we hope you can come to Ferrara, this is what you will see. Uh, you will see something that is in the middle, because right now the museum in his entirety, it's not finished. So we are talking about a work in progress. And I think this is uh, even more interesting because we, we don't have a set idea. We don't know what the future will uh, bring us. We only know the architecture, but we are still reflecting on how we want to uh, build the, the inside of the museum. If you see in the image, there is a um, huge building there where Mace uh, is written, and that's the building that was the prison. So today, the uh, still existing buildings that were part of the prisons complex were, are only two and before there were more there were three uh, and these two existing buildings form half of the uh, museum because we will have <laughs> we don't know when uh, but with, we're, at the end we will have four buildings two pre-existing and two that are uh, completely new 
I also brought two images from Ferrara. Why not? That's where we are. And the two images are actually from the Jewish uh, history of Ferrara, uh, because the street that you see, that's Via Mazzini, and Via Mazzini was the artery of the ghetto of Ferrara. Actually, before, even before the ghetto was uh, set, uh, the pre Jewish presence was already um, decided, let's say, they, they were already living in that area. Uh, the door is the door of the facade of the synagogue of Ferrara. Inside this building there are actually more than one synagogue. There are uh, the Italian synagogue, the German synagogue, and the Fanese synagogue. That it's a very small temple uh, made by the Jews that came from Fano, uh, a town in, uh, uh, in Italy. Uh, there was another synagogue, the Spanish synagogue, uh, of course, <laughs> since we're here, uh, I have to cite it, uh, and it was because many of the Jews who were expelled from Spain came to Ferrara because the, the duke of the city, the duke, duchy of Este, uh, actually welcomed the city, the, the Jews in the city. They wanted the, the, these uh, Spanish Jews because they saw a very interesting uh, uh, possibility of uh, economic economic growth. The Spanish and uh, Portuguese uh, uh, Jews were merchants, and this is what uh, the Este wanted. Uh, so there, there was a very interesting and very important Jewish community there. Dona Gracia Nasi was one of the Jews uh, who uh, lived in Ferrara, uh, Amato Lusitano, many Portuguese Jews that actually contributed very much uh, to the culture of the city, even of the city, not only of the Jewish side of the city, but also to the milieu, to the, to the uh, culture of uh, Ferrara. And here we go to our museum. If you see, this is only a rendering. This is how things will be. This is not uh, the... Um, what we see right now, a lot of green, as uh, <laughs> before they were, uh, we were looking at renderings at how the model, uh, model of prison will be. Uh, architects really like this idea of uh, green in the city, of renovation. Uh, so actually this is something that uh, it, we are supposed to have uh, in our museum too. Not only that, but uh, maybe you see it, there is a green line um, and that these are the walls uh, of Ferrara, because Ferrara is a city that uh, is surrounded by walls, and this is very important for the history of the prison, because that part where the prison was situated, today it's where the museum is, uh, was a part of the city that was not uh, there were no buildings there. It was only for um, agricultural purposes. So when the time came to find a new place for the prison of the city, that's where they uh, decided to, to build the new prison. And this is quite interesting actually because the prison changed the, meta the, the uh, city, the surroundings of the city. It, it was interesting for me too while I was looking at, at the history of the prison to reread the things because it's quite interesting. Today we talk about renovation. Uh, again, it's something very interesting. It's something that everyone wants to do in the city. We talk about the new aspect of the cities, uh, but it was something that happened at the time. And today we say that a prison can be a museum and this can change the face and also the spirit of uh, a part of the city. But at the time, the prison changed the face and the spirit of a part of Ferrara, and not in a bad way. People came and decided to live in that part of the city because of the prison. So it's quite interesting uh, for, for, for us today. And this is how the prison was. It's different from uh, this one, uh, but in, you, you will see another uh, image. Inside, it's quite uh, it's quite striking because we, we see the same uh, structure. This was the outside uh, and the structure was called a telegraph pole, 
palo telegrafico. So it's different from the panoptic uh, uh, structure. What today survives, it's what you see here, uh, the prison that was the male prison, and that's also the part of the prison that was uh, in uh, its uh, story, uh, the part of the prison where the uh, political prisoners and the Jews were held. Uh, and again, this prison has a long life. It didn't start for political purposes. It was just a prison. It actually was very um, ahead of its time. Um, when Italy changed and, and when actually Italy started to exist after un the unification, uh, the state also decided to change, uh, the radically change the system of prisons. So in Ferrara that meant that the old prison that was inside the center of the city was dismantled and they had to find a new place, a more human also uh, space. And in 1908, they start to build the prison. It will open in 1912. And the uh, newspapers of the city are, are quite interesting because they talk about this new prison and how the, the cells are bigger and wider and better for the inmates. Of course, uh, the reality when they started to use it was a little bit different. A cell that was supposed to be, we spoke about it before, the cell that was, to be, was supposed to be a single inmate cell was used for more than one. Uh, the history of this prison was a very long one because it stopped in 1992. So you, you see it's more than almost a hundred years of, uh, uh, of use. And in 19, from, let's say, 1940, mostly, until 1945 and even 1946, uh, there were political inmates. Why I say also 45, 46? Because after the war, not only we have uh, political inmates before the war, but we have them after the war. So the fascists, actually, um, and of course, this is part of the Italian history. After the war, some of the fascists were taken to the uh, local prison. I will show you the inside. As you see, it's, it's, it's quite striking. If you saw this uh, prison, uh, I just sent an, a picture to one of my colleagues, to the architect, that actually uh, she made uh, her uh, thesis on this prison, and now she works uh, with us at the museum. Uh, so a lot of the, the uh, things that I'm uh, saying about the, the, the um, prison are thanks to her uh, work, uh, Giulia Gallerani. Uh, so actually, and she was also stricken by this, uh, uh, this re resemblance. This is not what you see today. Again, I'm showing you what was, and then we'll see w what it is. Uh, I don't know if uh, it was the right thing to do. You will tell me. <laughs> but this, this was the prison. Uh, this was also something that we showed to the people, because, again, the idea was that we had to bring the population of Ferrara to be part of uh, our work. So the ever-changing transformation of the building was uh, presented to the public uh, because the museum and having a national museum of, of Judaism in Ferrara maybe could be a little bit uh, strange. So we wanted the people from Ferrara, from the city, to be part of this uh, uh, project. I don't know if you can recognize him, if uh, many Italians uh, knew who he was. In Ferrara, everyone knows who he is. This is Giorgio Bassani. And also the other one is uh, Matilde Bassani. They're not related. The name is the same. Giorgio Bassani is the writer who wrote The Garden of the Finzi Contini, Il Giardino dei Finzi Contini. And uh, he was actually uh, a political um, inmate in the prison. So he was in the prison not because he was a Jew, but because he was uh, fighting against the fascist regime. Uh, in Ferrara, they, 
Ferrara actually was a very fascist city, and what is interesting is uh, at the time, even the mayor of the city, the fascist mayor of the city, was a Jew. So we have this very peculiar story, yes, of uh, uh, of a Jewish person that was actually um, part of the fascist regime. On the other side, we have some Jews like uh, Matilde Bassani and Giorgio Bassani that were actually very active against uh, fascism. Uh, I didn't uh, include the picture, but Alda Costa uh, was a... Um, teacher in uh, uh, Ferrara, and today there is a school, an elementary school, uh, and a primary school on her name, and she was actually the one who was leading uh, this group of anti-fascists in uh, Ferrara. She was also held prisoner in the uh, prison of Via Piangipane. We call it like that, we don't call it our uh, museum. Um, some of the Jews uh, not many of the, the Jews actually, we were talking about it before, but this is something very important. Some of the Jews who were deported from Ferrara um, went through the prison, but it was only a small part. Most of them were held in uh, uh, Via Mazzini, in this uh, complex that I showed you before, and also in uh, the um, caserma, and now I don't remember the name in uh, English, sorry, um, in, uh, um, in Via Bevilacqua. And now I will change pace completely. <laughs> And here we come to the idea of the museum. So the idea of the museum is uh, uh, not so young, because we are in 2022, so 20 years passed. In 2003, the first law passed, and the first law was about the Museum of the Shoah. But today, the name of the museum is quite different. It's not only a museum of the Shoah, it's the, museum, the National Museum of Italian Judaism. So how did we came there? At the beginning, there was an idea of a memorial, but it was a memorial um, mostly like a statue. In, uh, uh, so it was, I hope you can excuse the word, it's almost a passive uh, way to interact about memory. Uh, and the Shoah, it was not an active part. So this first idea developed and became the idea of a museum of the Shoah that it, Italy at the time didn't have. And then the idea was quite uh, imp nice, let's say, quite, quite interesting, quite important. So what happened during 2003 and 2006? Rome came forward and they said, we want to have a museum of the Shoah too, of course. Rome is a very significant part of the terrible story of the Shoah in Italy. Um, so what happened? In a very Italian way, or Salomonic way, uh, <laughs> since we are talking about Jews, uh, we have two museums of the Shoah, one in Ferrara that has also the, let's say, active part of the Jews in Italy, 2,000 years of history, and the Museum of the Shoah in Rome that is only dedicated to the memory of the Shoah. So uh, this came through with uh, another uh, law uh, on the 27th December of 2006, and this is quite important because by law we are recognized from the ministry. So actually the Ministry of Culture is our Again, pass me the definition, main sponsor. <laughs> 2007, what happens? Because the idea was before we even chose the place, they chose the place. I wasn't even there. I was uh, studying uh, for my uh, MA on uh, museology. Um, the idea was where do we put this uh, museum? And they talked about it a lot. And there was a space in Ferrara that was completely uh, neglected. Uh, the prison stopped working in 1992, and from there on, it, there was nothing. The building was there, the buildings were there. Uh, no one was there, only people, it was actually, it, it's a very sad part of the story because there were people living in there, squatting, 
let's say. Uh, so poor family was were living in this uh, terrible state in the in in the prison. But they decided again renovation. We were talking about uh, rethinking about an area of the city, and this is how they thought they will rethink about this area of Ferrara, and the prison will. Um, have to, to change from a place that is closed, so a, a place where ideas are not welcome, but also uh, the debate with the outside world, it's not welcome. When you put someone in prison, you can talk a lot about uh, the idea of uh, prison like some a place where you change for the better someone, but let's face it, it's not, not like that. You take them away from society. So the idea was that with the museum, we will have this place that was taking away ideas from societies and people from society. Then we have a museum that is just the opposite because a museum is not a memorial and of course a museum is not a prison. A museum is something, it's a space, but it's also um, a place that is supposed to have a dialogue with people, with the outside world. If not, we're not doing uh, our job well. So this is why uh, they decided to have the museum uh, in, in the prison. This is what was going on at the time. So you see, it, it's, it's, of course, everything is uh, left uh, to decay. Here you see um, some of the structures that you even can recognize from here. This is something that actually uh, was written on the walls. We tried to, to go around and uh, uh, make pictures of uh, what was left. It was not easy because for a small period of time, uh, the, muse the prison became a um, um, set for uh, television. And there was a very, I don't know if you know it here, but in Italy, it's, um, everyone knows it, uh, Gomorra. Yes, the series of uh, for the TV series for Gomorra was shot in uh, our museum or in the former prison because it was the only prison that was still a prison but not used as such. Uh, and actually, for us, it 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 was a little bit of a problem because uh, it left us with uh, things that were made for the TV and we didn't know what was uh, pre-existing or what was uh, made uh, for for the TV. So we're going on, and in 2001, there was the international competition for the architectural design. Studio Arco and Scape won, and they won with a project that had to incorporate a part of the pre-existing buildings. Uh, you see A uh, and C uh, are the ones that uh, were part of the museum. And then uh, we have other two buildings, B and D, that are the completely new ones. Those are also the buildings that we are uh, expecting, waiting for. So today we only have A and C. And these are some images from uh, the works inside. So you see it's already changing uh, uh, his face. <coughs> And this is another thing. This is what happened from the outside. Uh, where you see the rubble, that's where there was another building. That building was taken down because during time it changed so much inside that there was no um, historic interest. So they just decided to discard it. And it also the prison stopped working because it was in a terrible shape and condition. So that building is no longer there. This is what went on inside. You see it changing. Again, you see mirrors, a lot of white. No, this sense of uh, opening. This is actually something that uh, it, it's not from the uh, first project for the museum, but we realized uh, we people that worked in the museum, that the buildings won't come so quickly. So we had this huge space between the two buildings, and what should we do? Uh, so we decided to do something, to, to play with the space, 
and to have a garden. So here you have the phases of the garden, and that's how it is right now. So, in these uh, last minutes, because I don't want to take away uh, time, and also there's time for questions, so if you still have questions about the museums, you can ask them. I will show you a little bit of what we do. Um, this is an installation. This is the garden. The garden is, is ex actually uh, called of questions because the idea is that you don't know everything about Judaism, so you can be wrong. Uh, but if you fail, you still can uh, learn something new. So the idea is that we have a space for failure that is not something that in society we usually have. Uh, and actually at the museum, that's what we have, a space for failure. That's the part for the first exhibition. Again, the idea is a museum that is a work in progress. So we don't have the building B. The building B is supposed to host the uh, permanent exhibition. So what should we do? Uh, stop, not reflect, not open to the public. We decided that we will open to the public building C through many temporary exhibitions and then through the temporary exhibitions, we will build the permanent exhibition. So today, that's what people see. This was also part of the first exhibition. This area of the museum was actually the uh, upper floor, second floor, where the um, multiple cells were. Uh, you have to think about it was supposed to be around to host something like 15 people, but of course it came to have something like 40, 50 people all in one room with one um, um, bathroom, toilet in the middle. It was really horrible. So today you don't see it. Uh, it's, it's unrecognizable from what it was before. This is Titus because in our uh, 2000 years, we also talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. And this is, again, Titus, but in another way. This is the Arch of Titus, and also a replica, uh, an architectural replica of the Colosseum. Again, what we are trying to do is to um, present the history of Italy and its Jews. So, of course, this is the history of Italy, the Colosseum. Everybody knows the Colosseum. Not everyone knows about the Jewish history of the Colosseum. This is uh, a catacomb. Ah, and this is the part of the Renaissance. Renaissance. The second exhibition was uh, completely focused on the Renaissance. And it was actually interesting because we had something about the exile from Spain. This is the moment where Italian Judaism changes completely because the uh, uh, people from uh, uh, Spain and Portugal come to Italy, so there's a strong number of, of Jews that come from Italy and things change. We see it in the art, in the culture, it's very interesting. A small part of the actual exhibition, uh, four people curated the exhibition, one of them is me, but most importantly, Andreina Contessa, Simonetta della Seta, the former director, and Carolotta Ferrara degli Uberti. The idea is that this is an exhibition that talks about and reflects about identity. We start in the 15th uh, hundred and we arrive until the 1900. So it's a long t period of time and we reflect about identity. This is something that actually it's interesting if we talk about prisons because the idea of identity is what is an identity when I'm forced to be someone. The Jews during the ghetto era knew what, what they were also because of the things they, they could not be. They were segregated, they were taken apart from society, they were something different. And what also is me when I'm not, uh, when, when I'm free to be me. After the emancipation, the Jews were like everyone else. So the idea is the reflection of these two uh, ways to express uh, the, the same identity. Again, this, I wanted to show you this because maybe here you can see these was a cell. 
this is the floor plan. So uh, what you see where the the um, the images, uh, this v amazing painting, this was one of the cells. So what they did is actually they uh, united all the cells. There is a corridor in the middle that it still used as a corridor, but we um, portion it every time with uh, uh, elements of uh, architecture because we really need the space to uh, do the exhibitions. Um, but if you think about the images that you saw before of the prison, it's not that uh, it's not quickly relatable to to the same idea of prison. These are very interesting uh, textiles, but I won't go on there. There is a part of uh, the 1900, and I will stop with 1938, Humanity Denied. This is uh, something about the Shoah, but not only. So it starts with the racial laws that, of course, in Italy has, are very uh, important and a part of the history of Italy. We cannot skip uh, on them. Uh, and they start with the idea of again, what it means not to be citizens like everyone else, what it means to lose everything, uh, the, the space in, in, uh, in society. Uh, this part is also, of course, on deportation. This is a site-specific um, work of art by an Israeli artist. Uh, his name is Danny Caravan. Uh, of course, I don't have to explain to you uh, what it means, but again, the idea is we don't have a lot of space, but we still want to uh, talk about uh, difficult topics, and we don't want to do it in a rushed way. So it, it's important to maintain uh, an historical uh, perspective. It's very important to uh, show things that are true. I think that today we, it's, it's not always like that. Uh, so the forthcoming images, uh, I will uh, move quite quickly. Uh, you will see what we do. It's uh, quite, quite um, like the new life that they want to give to this prison. Uh, we have to use the spaces. So what we do? We also have the cinema. Again, this is a, a way to bring back this space for the city. This was a space that no one could enter. Uh, we are trying to do something uh, different. We work with different categories. This is um, for uh, people who don't see. We also uh, work with the um, sound impaired. Uh, people. We have a bookshop, like every uh, museum, uh, a library, a teaching hall, but also we work a lot, like everyone, on the online uh, offer today. We have a lot of online activities. Actually, uh, one of the most important activities that we will do this year uh, on the uh, for the Day of Remembrance will be on Monday, the 31, uh, and we will have an online activity for something like 400 schools that registered from everywhere in Italy. And in any way, we couldn't have, even before Corona, we couldn't have the space for 400 uh, uh, classes. And every class is around 20 people. So actually, this was really interesting. And I think that this, this was a, an opportunity that we had to uh, reflect on. Uh, the museum is in Ferrara. Ferrara is not a big town. It's uh, next to Bologna in the north of Italy. What happens with uh, schools in uh, Sicily? What happens with schools in uh, Calabria in the south of Italy? The online activities are there to um, near the gap. Summer at Mace. <laughs> I want to show you to, to close. These are the renderings. Again, you see people, who knows, <laughs> cars, uh, if this what will be. But this is uh, what is supposed to be the uh, Corpo D, Building D, that will completely change the entrance of the museum on the other side. Uh, the 
buildings are being built right now, building B, uh, D, sorry, the buildings are in charge of the ministry. So there is a foundation for the everyday life of the museum, but the ministry is in charge of the architectural part. So we can say it's not us, it's them. <laughs> We'll never say something like that. We 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 want to maintain a very <laughs> nice um, uh, relationship with the ministry. Uh, so this is the other side of the building, as you see, trees, water. Who knows? Uh, we'll see what will happen. And this is what uh, we have today. Uh, again, thank you, but uh, if you have other questions, I'm here. This is a small Bassani. Uh, <laughs> it's one of the activities, actually, that we made. We, we work a lot with schools. It's, it's very important for us to have schools and bring them. Uh, and we try to have different activities for every type of uh, age. Not everyone can uh, uh, work on the shore. This is also very important for us. Small children are not in the age uh, to, to uh, work on the show, but there are other ways to, to uh, talk with them and to make them part of this part of the history of Ferrara. Done? Thank you. Well, thank, you thank you very much, uh, Sharon. Uh, very ongoing, interesting project. Let's not criticize the authorities uh, <laughs> that they have to put money on this kind of projects. Well, we hope one day we will have this kind of activities also inside this prison. Uh, now, uh, we have Julia Calvet, historian. He will talk to us about the history, not the, just the place, but uh, something that has a direct relation with this space, as I said before. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'd like to thank Jordi and the rest of the team for inviting me in this very interesting session at uh, Model um, Prison, Barcelona's Jordi said. I will make a more historical uh, intervention about the, the, the history uh, of uh, this place after this very interesting presentation delivered by Sharon on museology. As Jordi just said before, we're speaking about model prison, uh, 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 a man's uh, penitentiary from 1904 to 2017, including many prisoners of different regions, countries, uh, uh, political and common prisoners. If we make a balance of this prison and the prisoners that, that stayed here under the political uh, events and social struggles, well, we had the tragic, the so-called tragic week, uh, unionism of the 1920s, civil war, then Primo de Rivera's dictatorship, the civil war, post-war, Franco's dictatorship, the struggle for democracy. And in this uh, historical account, oftentimes we skip the years of the uh, Second World War. As Jordi Gizia said before, between 1939 and 1945, during this times, during these years, the war was full of political prisoners connected to this role of this uh, uh, prison as uh, uh, repression against uh, Republicans and, 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 and anti-Franco's uh, adepts. But we had hundreds of people who had arrived to Spain, to Catalonia, escaping from World War II and escaping from Nazism. This is uh, what I would like to talk about. I will make a, a first historical contextualization, and then I will tell you some examples of people or groups of people who uh, visited this uh, prison in the six years that lasted World War II after some uh, witnesses that were here and that reflected with and through their memories and interviews this period of time, this months, uh, uh, they, they, well, the months they stayed in this prison. Well, it's rather well known 
that in 1939, in 1945, 80,000 people and stayed here and 85,000 were arrested by civil court by the uh, army from the or by the police in uh, Spain most of these 50 80,000 people and 85,000 people uh, were right to Spain uh, undercover through the Pyrenees Uh, in uh, Girona's Pyrenee or, or, or Huesca's Pyrenee, they didn't have any documents, they didn't have uh, any visas or passports. Who are these people? Well, quickly, let me tell you that, uh, well, we have to talk about the different categories of people that arrived uh, to, to, to Catalonia and that were imprisoned in this prison. Well, basically, the six big groups that I mentioned to, to you includes French young people who uh, decided to escape from the occupied uh, France after June 1940, after, after the Gaulle's, uh, the Gaulle's general uh, speech asking young people in military age to go to the north of Africa to, to gather there and fight against the Nazis. In spring of 1943, another wave of young French people escaped from France that took all the young uh, French men to work to Germany. Uh, they were trying to escape these conditions. These are the two important moments of escape of these uh, French people that represent 60-65% of the total of people that uh, arrived to Spain. And well, secondly, we had the Jews, Jews that, as you know, escaped from the uh, Nazi uh, prosecution in Germany in 1933, and then in Austria, and that little by little was uh, uh, increased with the uh, occupation of half Europe uh, by the Nazi army, uh, Poland, um, Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, and then France. Their final goal was to escape from, from Europe, to, to escape from uh, prosecution. There's a big paradox. You know, fugitives from Nazism came to, to Spain uh, that was uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ruled by by a dictatorship, so uh, they were such good friends with with the Nazis. Well, then we have people uh, of countries, uh, na natives of countries that uh, were uh, or had been attacked by by the Nazis, Poland, etc. People that skate with the intention of reaching the north of Africa, some of them, and then others to to, to the UK to continue fighting. Uh, uh, Pilots, uh, aviation pilots who were part of this group, Canadian, um, North American, and, and British. They were important after 1943 and 1944. It's so moments at the beginning of, uh, the, of World War II, 1939, 1940, uh, mid 1941, some politicians from the occupied countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, Poland, uh, well, crossed uh, the, the border of Spain to, in order to go back to the UK or to go to the Belgian Congo to recreate their governments and, and you know, build a, a new government in Excel. And the final group, the less studied, that arrived here uh, in the fall of 1944 and 1945 and, and further on, till at the beginning of the 1950s, some uh, Nazi uh, German uh, border guards, that the people that were uh, in, the, in the borders, uh, German Nazis that were escaping from the uh, uh, Europe that was in the hands of the Allies, and they were trying to find refuge in uh, the in Franco Spain. That was the, the, the last group of refugees that escaped uh, other countries of Europe that arrived in Spain. This was this is the la the human landscape of the the refugees that escaped from World War II. Here we have some pictures. On the left, you have the two Belgian politicians, Spank and Pierre Lott, that uh, uh, escaped uh, in 1940s. Uh, the Spanish government wouldn't, didn't let them cross uh, through the border officially, and they did it in the clandestine. And they went uh, through Portugal, and they went back to the UK. On the right, we have the uh, pilot of uh, the Allied aviation. 
General Jigger, he crossed from in 1944 through the Pyrenees in Lleida. And we have many names and pictures of Jewish people, families, women, children, men that uh, at one moment in history during these nearly six years used the uh, uh, Pyrenees between France, Andorra, and Spain to escape from the Nazi, the Nazi oppression. This is a map difficult to, to maybe to, to, to read, which explains the, the main escape routes from France to uh, Catalonia. We have two points of concentration in France, Toulouse on the one hand, and Perpignan on the other. Andorra and Perpignan. People that were trying to escape to Girona and Barcelona as the place of concentration, as I will tell you, both for, for those that arrived uh, in the clandestinity, uh, that arrived here in, uh, to the Barcelona, as well as those that were arrested for one reason or the other. Barcelona was the place of concentration. As I said before, the, the immense majority of these refugees were arrested. Uh, mainly uh, by the civil guard, Guardia Civil. The Pyrenees had become the main concern for the Franco's government. Uh, they were not thinking about the south, but the north. So the logical effects of World War II, uh, any attempt of uh, invasion of Spain uh, by some of the uh, armies that uh, was taking part, actively part in, in, in the war. And also because in the south of France, there were hundreds of thousands of Republican refugees uh, that, uh, well, you know, uh, were very active against uh, the dictatorship. So there was a fear <clears throat> with respect to what these people could do. Therefore, this border was uh, watched by this Guardia Civil as well as by the uh, police and the, the Spanish uh, intelligence services that were watching what was happening in the borders. And anyone who was, uh, anyone who was moving in the border in one or the other direction was uh, controlled. They were trying to, to uh, make this border impermeable. Uh, but even in spite of all this, some of the refugees were able to, to reach Barcelona without uh, any uh, big problems. Why Barcelona? Well, because in Barcelona there, they had the Allied consulates, the British, North American, Belgian, Dutch consulates, and they could help them uh, reach their goal, which was to go to the north of Africa, to the UK, or in the case of Jews, to escape towards uh, the Americas, which was their main interest. The con American consulate for young French people uh, like the French Lycée or the French Institute that they became involved in Barcelona with uh, dissidents, uh, with dissidents and, and, and trying to help people that were escaping from the government of Vichy. But in these places, uh, well, uh, included the, the prison, uh, model prison, which was the place of, of uh, uh, concentration of these people that were arrested in the Pyrenees or that uh, were arrested from the Pyrenees to the city of Barcelona. What was uh, the treatment received by these people from the uh, Spanish uh, government? Well, they were considered as uh, mm, uh, political prisoners, uh, and they were uh, well sent to the uh, civil governor in each province. Then they had uh, uh, prisons in La Seu d'Urgell, uh, Biella, Ripoll, Figueras, and then they were transferred to the provincial prison at the, at the capital of each province, Lleida or Girona in this case, besides Barcelona. It was the regular process after 1943, uh, from 1939 to 1943. But in each province, they had their own, uh, their own set of, of, of uh, rules the civil government of Lleida did not act the same as in Girona, or the head of the uh, Guardia Civil in Biella acted the same way as in La Junquera. There were some uh, differences with respect to the orders uh, received. But the unified regulation arrived from Spain. Uh, there was a commission of the ministries uh, in um, foreign affairs and the army after 1943. But in spite of it all, if we check all the documents, there were differences in the way they treated prisoners in each province. 
with respect to legislation, well, they determined that young men between 18 and 40 years of age were considered uh, men in uh, military age. They were not sent, therefore, to uh, civil prisons, but they were sent to concentration camps. At the beginning of the 1940s, some of the concentration camps that had uh, been uh, uh, created during the Civil War and still survive. I speak about the Cervera concentration camp, the concentration camp at Reus, another concentration camp in Irun, in an old uh, weaver's manufacturing plant, and Marian de Ebro uh, concentration camp in the province of Burgos. Therefore, the role of the model uh, prison was to, you know, uh, receive these prisoners that were arrested in the uh, province of Girona and to be sent to Miranda de Ebro concentration camp. So there were, well, in 1941, uh, finally, uh, Miranda de Ebro was the area where these uh, people that were arrested in the military aged between 18 and 40 years of age uh, well, came to the mother prison uh, for some days or some weeks before they were transferred to Miranda de Ebro. The same happened uh, with prisoners arrested in Lleida. They normally went to the capital first, and from Lleida they went to Zaragoza, Logroño, or Miranda de Ebro. In the case of Girona, all of them were sent to Barcelona and to this uh, prison. They were taken by train from Figueres, from Porvo, and they uh, reached the Barcelona train station, and then to the prison, this prison here where we are now. The concentration camp lasted for many years uh, during the Civil War, since 1937 to 1947. Ten years, first it hosted uh, Republicans, then international brigadists uh, and refugees that arrived between 1939 to 1944. And then from 1944, all the German Nazis that were seeking for Franco's protection. The tragic between Barcelona and Miranda de Ebro was different. Some uh, Well, there were two routes. The first one went through Tarragona and Caspe, uh, two routes con uh, following the train rails. There was a, a stop at the co rails concentration camp, and a second round, uh, which was which was a train going between Barcelona's train station to Cerver, and then stopping at Cerver. So Cerver and Reus were uh, right in the middle of this uh, uh, tragic, uh, train tragic train uh, uh, trip that lasted up to four days. Considering this global uh, and quick overview of the procedure, let me focus on the model uh, prison and the role it had as the place to, of, of incarceration of these people that had arrived to Spain. It's worth mentioning that not only this prison received and hosted these refugees, but also there were other uh, places, other penitentiaries uh, where some uh, people were taken to. The castle of Montjuic uh, was one of them. Some uh, militaries uh, of, a, of a high uh, ranking uh, that were arrested in the Pyrenees of Girona uh, to be later on sent to Miranda de Ebro concentration camp. And after the protests of the different uh, allied uh, um, diplomatic uh, legations, uh, well, a small concentration or refugees camp was prepared in Zaragoza at Lama de Aragon. Other refugees were taken to Palau, the Palace of the Missions in Montjuic and the San Elias Convent. And another area uh, in Poplano between 1939 and 1940. All or, or nearly all prisoners came to the prison, the Tip Modelo prison. San Elias was uh, closed in 1942. And they stopped receiving the Second uh, World War II refugees in 1941. Who were these foreigners, these refugees that uh, came to Barcelona uh, pr model prison. Well, most of all were most of them for for Jews of different nationalities: Polish, Germans, Austrians, Dutch, Belgian. Other than 
these Jews will have Polish, Belgian, uh, British, some French and Dutch uh, prison, non-Jewish prisoners. And now I will try to give you some uh, uh, witnesses, some people that uh, explained their, their stay in uh, the model prison of Barcelona with their um, um, memoirs or books or interviews that some historians uh, uh, recorded. This uh, slide includes four places where refugees were uh, concentrated. In the upper left, we have the small prison of Sort, uh, Sort, which uh, well, uh, now is a small, very small museum that explains what what happened in 19, after 19, the year 2007. On the right, upper right, what was the Girona provincial Girona prison, small convent in the south. On the bottom left, the Cerver prison, a uh, building known as the cement. We had the concentration camp and then uh, the same university, uh, which uh, was used as a prisoner's camp. And on the right, bottom right, we have the concentration camp at Miranda de Ebrard in Burgos, in this camp that uh, was active for 10 years. As I said, the Jews were the most uh, numerous number of prisoners. And that, but we don't have many witnesses, many uh, histories. We have more Belgian uh, witnesses than Jewish witnesses. At least this is what I found. This is an example of the Jews that came here. Warner Baras, born in Poland in 1919. And, and and uh, who died in, in, in the U.S. in the year 2008. He was transferred to Barcelona before he went to Miranda de Ebro. He published his memoirs first in German, and they later on were translated into Spanish. Uh, the book was called Fugitive. And Rosa Sala uh, made a very nice preface. Uh, and Baras wrote about his uh, stay at Barcelona model prison. I don't remember. He says many days, 10,000 prisoners, little space. It was hot and we were tired physically and emotionally. We only stayed there one night in this case. His stay was very, very quick. Another uh, Jewish that uh, came to the model, Salomon Berger, he uh, had a first shop in, in Belgium. He uh was arrested in Puig in October 1942 with his wife and his son. His wife was taken to Caldas de Malavella uh, spa with his son and he ended up in a model uh, prison to be later on sent to Miranda de Ebro concentration camp. Another Jewish in 1944, Jacob Bernstein, he was a tailor. He was r re arrested uh, in Manlieu with a hundred, a thousand a hundred francs. He was also accused uh, of uh, smuggling uh, international currency. So, well, this this smuggling. Uh, was usually uh, um, dealt with by a, a Madrid judge, uh, and that uh, lengthened the uh, the state of prisoners of these Jewish uh, prisoners that uh, had held international currency. Other uh, Jewish prisoners were retained in Barcelona. People who had been able to make it to, to Barcelona without any further problems, but once they were here, police that watched all hotels, all hostels. Uh, arrested them at that moment. Uh, everything was highly controlled. Uh, train station, uh, uh, all train station, all train stations had police people. Even trains from coming from Girona, from Manresa, from Lleida to Barcelona, also had in each train uh, policemen that requested uh, documents from people. One of the people arrested was Jakob Newman, uh, born in. Uh, Poland in 1884, and after leaving Spain, he migrated to the U.S. and finally to Israel, where he passed away in 1982. Jacob 
uh, right Spain in October 1942 uh, through Andorra. He um, had escaped from a, a razzia in the south of France in the month of August of that year. Uh, his wife had been arrested in that uh, raid. And she ended up in Auschwitz where she passed away and Jacob was able to make it to Andorra and with the help of a, a, a guide he reached Barcelona. He was arrested by the secret police of Spain in the room of the same hotel where he, has, he was staying in. He was taken to uh, La Modelo prison. He stayed here for some weeks. He was taken to Madrid uh, and, the, and the judge told him to, well, uh, uh, sentenced him to, to be taken to Miranda de Ebro concentration camp, another example of Jews that uh, stayed in La Modelo prison for some time. It's worth mentioning that uh, other than Jews, uh, we had uh, some of the people that had helped them escape, escape uh, from the uh, Nazi uh, control. People uh, they escaped uh, through the support of uh, the uh, networks of evasion and, and the guides created by the Allies, uh, secret services, or Jewish uh, uh, associations. And they counted on the collaboration of people, of Spanish people or Catalan people, uh, who knew uh, the Pyrenees very well and who were in charge of uh, taking them from the border to Barcelona. Two of these people, who were part of the uh, one of the of the main networks of evasion that was uh, led by Francisco Ponzan, an, uh, an Aragonese anarchist, it was created in. Uh, this, this network was created in Toulouse, and they stayed in uh, Barcelona prison after being arrested. And after, you know, leaving these people, John Catala Balagna on the left from Pallares from Diabrosi, born in 1913. He was one of the main guides of Ponzan. He was arrested in Barcelona in 1942 after he transferred the group of uh, uh, airplane pilots uh, to the British uh, consulate, uh, and after meeting Eliseo Melis, who was another anarchist, who later on uh, was was found that he was a confidant of police, and then uh, well, uh, at the bar uh, he was arrested by the two policemen, and later on uh, he was taken to the uh, modeled uh, prison, but he escaped. He had escaped from Cadiz prison, and he is later on escaped from. The prison, and he's one of the, the people that ended up in, in model prison who was able to, to escape. Another anarchist, uh, Mr. Laurea, and he, uh, he had the record of uh, having helped uh, cross the biggest group of refugees from World War II that I know 62 people. He helped cross the Pyrenees in 1944 till Valdaran from the, the, the Lleida Pyrenees to Valdaran. It was an odyssey, a big odyssey. Two people died in this. Uh, uh, well, when Flor de la Barbera uh, uh, came to Barcelona, uh, leaving his uh, people, he wanted to go back to France. He was arrested in Puig Cerda. He was uh, taken to Girona. He was tortured and he was sent to uh, Model uh, Prison of Barcelona, where he stayed for one year till he was released. Another guide whose picture I don't have, Valeria Pinto, from Cubells, born in 1895. Uh, he worked for the British consulate. He was agent 402. He had uh, taken hundreds of uh, Allied uh, air airplane pilots from taken from different places when his network fell he was arrested the Valeria Pinto was taken to model to model prison as well out of the Jews as I said before there is a big uh, amount of uh, non-jewish people who also uh, um, passed by this prison a British uh, Michael Franken uh, arrested in July 1942 in Figueras. He was uh, in um, 
this prison for two weeks before he went to uh, Miranda de Ebro, a Polish people, a noble from also from from Belgium. He was uh, an officer uh, from the army. He uh, it was Etienne. Uh, his father was a, an anti-communist and very close to Franco's, or he sympathized with Franco's dictatorship. His son was arrested. He was a military. He was a lieutenant. And he was arrested together with other three colleagues, and he was taken to the model uh, prison in Barcelona. He knew about his father's sympathies. He wrote a letter to the minister, uh, how to the minister uh, of, of, well, Mr. Ramon Serra Nusunyar, and he uh, wrote a letter asking him for, to be released because of his father's contacts. And in his father, he said, I'm writing uh, on my knees in a cell of the Barcelona prison. In spite of this, Terlinden was uh, taken to Miranda de Ebro concentration camp. Another Belgian, uh, Eric Lombard, came to Barcelona handcuffed from Figueras and, and uh, watched by two uh, Guardia Civiles in the, in the month of June of 1942. He was expected, he was uh, waiting for uh, the Belgian uh, council. He was taken to these, to our prison. And he, his description uh, is very eloquent. He talked about this prison. He said, my cell was dirty. We weren't given anything to sleep on. The first dinner was a dirty soup. We uh, ate it inside of a, um, a pot. I, I miss uh, my tobacco. I cannot sleep well. The day after we were, uh, our heads were shaved. That was he. What he was writing. It, he said also, there's a group of 50 Belgian people. Some of them have been here for a month. Others for two months. And here's another person that has been here for even more than that, another Belgian. And let me finish with this. René Krins, born in 1921. He explained his uh, uh, stay in Barcelona and in our prison. He walked from uh, the train station to the, to the city by foot. There was a still tower with different galleries and where you could find the different cells. We had people that were about to be shot to death. People had fought against Franco. And usually at night, we could hear the steps of uh, the guards that were going to take these people uh, to be shot to death. Other Belgian military, uh, Lieutenant Simonetti, we were imprisoned, he said, in Barcelona for a few weeks. This prison was a model at the beginning who expected just one occupant for per cell, but at that time there were 15 people in each cell. I could go on for uh, many more uh, accounts uh, of Polish, French uh, people, other people from Belgium who explain their experience and their stay at uh, Model Prison. But to finish, then let me go back to the Jews. Two more examples. The imprisonment of Jews uh, was not exclusive to those that had crossed uh, the Pyrenees trying to find a refuge in, the Frank, in Franco Spain. Some uh, Jews who were, had been born to in, in Barcelona were imprisoned in this prison. We don't really know why. It was evident that there was a big anti Semitist uh, feeling in Franco's government. Uh, the, the, the orthodox fascists uh, admire Hitler, then they justified the uh, slaughter of the uh, Jewish uh, people. And there was a, 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 a favorite expression by Franco talking about the French Mason, Jewish, and communist conspiration against the uh, dictatorship. They connected Judaism to to Soviets and uh, and even Serrano Sunyer uh, said that the Juda Judaism is the new enemy of the new Spain. Well, two examples, as I said. 
Mr. Jose Palomas, I guess, on the right. Mr. Uh, had, was born in Turkey. He worked as a salesperson, and he created a small uh, shop. Uh, and on 20th of December, 1940, he was arrested by police in the street Marques Campo de Salvador. He was arrested at the Model uh, prison. Uh, he was sent to Miranda de Ebro, later on to another uh, concentration camp at Nanclares de la Oca, and he was released and he was forced to leave Spain uh, together with his wife and his son. They went back to the old Palestine under the British government. And he's st and, and, and the president of the Israeli uh, community in Barcelona, Edmundo Grunevam. He had been the president of the Israeli community in Barcelona. He was a person who had a right to Barcelona in 1911. He uh, had become a Spanish national in 1930. And the fact of being a Jew added to his quality of Mason. He was a Frank Mason. So with these two premises, he was arrested. He was judged. He stayed in Barcelona for 12 years and one day of imprisonment. And this uh, is what I wanted to explain to, to you, to all of you, this, the, the protagonism of the model prison in these years of the World War II, together with uh, the problems uh, that uh, the Republican prisoners had. I wanted to offer some of the witnesses so that well, you could learn more about the protagonism of model prison as a place of imprisonment of these re refugees of World War II. And that's it. When uh, history is explained about this uh, prisoner of, of this prison during these last 130 years of life, maybe we could include a chapter explaining what happened during these years of war. Thank you. Gracias, Josep. Thank you very much, Josep. We also hope that you will also collaborate with us so you will be less you will be able to tell us a story as much as we want to do it it's a bit cold but let's open the q a session so if you have any question for sharon or for joseph feel free to ask and please use the microphone so we can hear you from the booth uh, your presentation and thank you sharon as uh, i'm a little bit ashamed to say that as an Italian, I was not aware of uh, the museum in Ferrara. And I was there like three times, I have friends, but uh, I never had the chance to, to visit it. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, but my question was, I'm not sure if I understood well, but uh, uh, you said in a given moment that the Ministry of Culture is somehow your sponsor. So I guess that in... Uh, somehow the Ministry of Culture, like a big institution with like a capital letter, is uh, setting some boundaries in terms of content you might have to display. I'm not sure if that's the case. And uh, if, if it is the case, um, you were talking about uh, involving actively the community and uh, the citizenship in uh, being part of like creating the memory of uh, of your museum so my question was like uh, which tools do you use uh, which like which ways you have to tackle um, the participation of citizens in creating parts of the contents of the museum if thank you <laughs> happy happy to know that there are italians that Actually, it's funny because uh, last week we did a seminar with UCL, uh, with the University of London, and um, there were Italians who participated that didn't know about the museum, that they came to see the museum thanks to the seminar. So I'm quite happy that <laughs> we are continuing this. <laughs> um, following up, 
uh, we actually have a very uh, nice um, um, uh, rapporto um, link, let's say, to the uh, Ministry of Culture. We don't have any problems, actually. The idea is that the, the inter interesting thing is the museum has a board. So it's a foundation. It's run by a foundation. One of the members of the board is a representative of the, of the Ministry of Culture. One if, is the representative of the Emilia-Romagna region, where Ferrara is, one of the city, and one of the union of Jewish communities, Italian uh, Jewish communities. No one tells us what to say. No one tells us what to do. Of course, there are a little bit of, uh, <laughs> from time to time, um, they want us to uh, talk a little bit more about this or that, but they don't influence the narrative of the museum. This is very important because it's not that, um, not everyone has this luxury. Uh, what the ministry has, what is, for, for us Italian, we, we have a very uh, peculiar way of uh, um, run things in culture because we have a lot of laws and uh, this is why the museum actually is the way it is because we have a very strict way if something is believed to be or considered to be by the Italian government uh, and Ministry of Culture a cultural heritage uh, site or cultural heritage uh, object, you can not do whatever you want to do with it. So this is why we have two of the uh, buildings, pre-existing bu buildings, because those were the ones that were um, uh, con considered a cultural heritage by the ministry. So I hope I replied to the question that yes, we are free actually, we decide what to do. And it's uh, very endearing actually, because we are, it's 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 not every day that, that you can decide what you want to say. We are bind, bound by a mission, so we have to work on uh, not only on things of the past, but we are supposed to work on things of the future or the present. So we are supposed to have a very active role uh, in uh, um, in the Italian society. How we do it. It's not easy. Sometimes uh, we, we try to work uh, with the communities. We are actually starting to work with, as I said, with uh, hearing impaired communities. We welcome people from uh, uh, a hearing impaired uh, association and they came and, and looked at everything that we've done, the text, Mostly the text, and it was so interesting because this is not the first thing that we think about when uh, uh, <laughs> when you have people that don't hear. That the text will be the first thing that they have very peculiar ways of uh, uh, reading that are not what we think about. Uh, but also one thing that we tried to do at the beginning because we were fresh and young. Uh, we opened a um, muro, um, a wall, uh, to our public. So they wanted to ask us questions right on the wall. And, and we will reply. And it was very important for us because most of the time this was the perception. And actually the, the questions uh, reinforced this perception. People were thinking thinking about the Jews in the past. So how do the Jews live? How do the Jews were marrying? Uh, but there are Jews in Italy today, and we are there to talk about them also, to prove this is, not prove, but to tell the story of a, a minority that still is thriving in Italy, and still is part of the uh, social, uh, cultural uh, Italian world. So. I think that was one of the most challenging experiences because we we didn't have any control on the public. We knew that maybe some not so nice questions could be made, but actually everyone really respected the museum space. Uh, someone uh, uh, did some um, um, interesting geographics, let's say. <laughs> 
uh, on the walls, but uh, that was the, the, the only thing. There was no anti-Semitic uh, writings on the wall. We had a lot of schools, but still everyone well behaved. And it was really important because the garden actually stems from a question that we had on the wall. Because the question was, in Italian it's, um, I don't know if I can uh, say it well in English, but it, it was like, um, why uh, the Jews, them, why do the Jews don't eat pork? And it was them, damnazione, because the, the, and we know that the, the girl, it was a little girl, a child that wrote it. And Ferrara is a place uh, like Barcelona where uh, uh, pork is a very substantial part of, uh, <laughs> of, the, yes, of the culture of food. It's really, really important. And it, to us it was so interesting because we have this, small, this little girl that for her it's quite, it's impossible to understand and it's even uh, taking something from me not to eat pork. And then that's why we developed the Garden of Questions, because it's all around uh, how do Jews eat and uh, what they can eat, what uh, they can mix, what not. Uh, so this is our way to try to involve communities. It's not easy. I will say it, as I said to them, uh, I always say it, we are seven people in the offices of the museum. So uh, we are starting to grow. We hope to welcome new colleagues. Uh, it would be amazing for the museums, but uh, for us too. Uh, and we still have a lot uh, to, to do and to grow, but that, that was one of the examples. And uh, when you come to Ferrara, tell, tell, tell me, because uh, I will be ha very happy to have you there. <laughs> If there are no further questions, we will call it a day. Thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you, Josep. And we invite you to follow the online and on-site activities of the Eurom. Thank you very much for coming here to the model. Thank you.